Okay, here we are. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown. Welcome to you if this happens to be your first time here. All the rest of y'all, thanks for showing up again. Now, we have a very unusual day here, my friends, on many levels. For one, Charles Eisenstein is here. How did that happen? (laughs) Well, you're going to find out. But as if that wasn't enough, I find myself in a rare moment where I'm at a loss for how best to introduce this week's episode. I've been doing this show for over five years now, and I usually have a pretty good idea. I have a little bit of a formula, you know. If you've been listening, you know. I like to say a few things about what's happening with the episode today, and then I like to check in some with what's happening with me or what's happening in the world. You know, I've got a little thing that I normally do. But sometimes I'm not sure that my formula is appropriate, or sometimes I'm at a loss, and this is one of those times. First, as I just mentioned, Charles Eisenstein is here, which is totally crazy. But more than that even, I feel myself at a real dilemma as to whether or not I should be speaking about the Black Lives Matter protests. Last week, I mentioned it, of course, saying that I didn't think I should be making any statements, and I, I still think that's largely true. But when I was getting ready to record just now, my first thought was, look, just don't mention anything about protests. You got Charles Eisenstein here today. It's kind of a big deal for the show. Just maybe you don't need to say anything about the protests at all. Just do a quick, tight intro. Hey, isn't it crazy? Charles Eisenstein here. Let's get to it. Don't say anything at all. That would have been the easiest choice. But then immediately... I thought, no, you can't do that. That's a silence that is actually harmful because it makes it easier for everyone to just carry on with the way things were going before. And I haven't been doing that, and I don't think that whoever's listening to this should be doing that. So I've got two things that I think might be appropriate for me to say. First thing is, If you haven't watched the new Dave Chappelle video, I want to encourage you to go watch it. Just go to YouTube, type in Dave Chappelle, and then the number is 846, 846, and watch the video that comes up. I watched it a couple of times, and it really hit me. And then after I watched that, I made myself watch the entire video of George Floyd being killed. I had seen like, you know, a little clip and like images and you you read the story, you knew what happened. But after watching the Dave Chappelle video, I decided I needed to watch the whole thing, like make myself watch it. And I wanted to turn it off at several points and I didn't. Made myself watch it. And I think everybody needs to. It's just important. You got to see it. Because if you see it and you have even a shred of empathy to you, you start to understand, especially if you watch the Dave Chappelle thing and then, because it really puts it into a context. I don't know why it is about comedians for me, but he actually says it in his special. I won't give it away. Just go watch it. I was about to give something away. I'm not going to spoil anything. Just go watch those videos. That's the first thing I wanted to say. Watch the Dave Chappelle video and then actually watch the entire video of George Floyd being killed. Then the second thing is that last week I mentioned this idea of defunding the police. And that conversation is carried on. And I've heard more people say, even like, you know, big name people say, we got to have police. So this week I heard the perfect response to this question about what defunding the police means. And it was asked of a progressive politician here in the United States Her name is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. 
And she was asked, what does an America with defunded police look like to you? And here's how she responded. The good news is that it actually doesn't take a ton of imagination. It looks like a suburb. Affluent white communities already live in a world where they choose to fund youth, health, housing, etc. more than they fund police. These communities have lower crime rates, not because they have more police, but because they have more resources to support healthy society in a way that reduces crime. When a teenager or preteen does something harmful in a suburb, white communities bend over backwards to find alternatives to incarceration for their loved ones to protect their future. Why don't we treat black and brown people the same way? Why doesn't the criminal system care about black teens' futures? Why doesn't the news use black people's graduation or family photos in stories the way they do when they cover white people who commit harmful crimes? Affluent white suburbs also design their own lives so that they walk through the world without having much interruption or interaction with the police at all, aside from community events and speeding tickets. Just starting there would be a drastically and radically different world than what we are experiencing now. So that's it. That's what it means. Defunding the police just means treating black and brown people the same way we treat white people. That's what it means. So I hope people out there are still doing what they can, whether that's educating yourself, talking to people, or getting out on the streets just seems like we're really at a pivotal point and I don't think we should take it lightly. And there's nothing being taken lightly in today's talk with Charles Eisenstein. If you're not familiar with Charles Eisenstein, he's a writer and he has been writing about social issues and environment for a lot of years, but recently he wrote an essay called The Coronation that was about what he calls moving from a story of separation to a story of interbeing. And he was writing about how he thought that the pandemic was an opportunity for us to potentially do that. And a lot of people took issue with him. (laughs) And that includes Derek Beres, who was on the show a few weeks ago, if you were listening and his co-hosts on the Conspirituality podcast. Well, it's a crazy turn of events and a specific set of circumstances that led to this conversation. And I'm going to tell the whole story of exactly how it happened at the beginning. You'll hear. But just to say I didn't feel like I could go into this conversation in the way that I normally do. I felt like I really had to go in with a devil's advocate hat on. And so just to know, it's a little bit of an unusual episode. And I have remarks, having had a chance to go back and listen to it a couple of times. And honestly, I don't usually listen to the episodes more than once. Like I record them, I listen back to them once and do any editing if there needs to be, which there usually isn't. But when I listen to it once and then it goes out to you. But this time I I had to listen to this one more than once. (laughs) And I don't know, I have some, some thoughts on it, some, some opinions about it. And I didn't voice all of my opinions during the conversation, which I normally do. As you know, I don't usually hold my tongue on anything, but I kind of did in this one. So I'm going to make those remarks on the other side, though. I don't want to put them here and get in the way of anything. I'd like for you to listen to the conversation first, and then if you want to stick around and hear some of what I think about it afterwards, you can. At the very least, though, it's a deeply interesting conversation about important and powerful ideas, and I am amazed and grateful that it happened, and excited that you are getting to hear it today. Real quick, before we do, 
Let me mention that this episode is brought to you in support from podcast premium subscribers, Jacqueline Gilby and Alexandra Cooper. We are so grateful to people who are choosing to become podcast premium subscribers. Not only do they get access to the full archives, but it's the best way to support and help sustain this show. So thanks to Jacqueline and Alexandra. If you want to learn more about becoming a podcast premium subscriber or learn about any of the other stuff that I do and offer, you can find out about all of it at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, that's it. Let's go ahead. Okay, everybody, get ready, (laughs) sit down, (laughs) and I will touch base with you on the other side. But for now, let's listen to this conversation that I had with Charles Eisenstein. Hello? Hello. Is this Charles Eisenstein? It is, and you must be Jay Brown. I don't even know your first name. Do you just go by Jay Brown? I do go by Jay Brown. My first name is Jason, but there's always been another Jason Brown my whole life. And I started going by Jay period because I thought it was writerly at an early time in my life. And I've just (laughs) continued using it. Cool. Well, Charles, it is quite a trip to be speaking with you, (laughs) I have to say. Uh And, And normally I would... I would like make some small talk with you. Like I have this idea for the show that I imagine I'm like at some party and I'm standing in the living room and then like you're, you're there standing next to me and I just turn and like say, hey, I'm Jay and introduce myself and we get to talking. Yeah. That, that's normally how I like to type dive into these things. But frankly, this moment is much more loaded than that. And trying to make small talk with you feels horribly artificial. So I'm not going to bother all right. And and instead I feel like by way of some introduction like for you and for anybody who might end up listening to this I want to share exactly how this moment came about and why I feel like it's so loaded. Mm-hmm. Because I don't know it was 3 weeks ago I was up in the middle of the night because I couldn't sleep. And sometimes when I can't sleep I I go downstairs into my kitchen and I just like think about stuff and I write stuff down and usually that'll help me get back to sleep again. And so three weeks ago, it's like 2.30 in the morning, I'm sitting at my kitchen table and I'm thinking about Charles Eisenstein because a couple of weeks before that, I had a conversation with my friend and then she sent me a link to a video of yours. And I was really intrigued and I sort of like, dove in and read a bunch of your stuff and watched all these videos. And I really had a very positive experience with it. I felt very empowered by it. I have this feeling like when I, when I feel like I have a lay of the, the macro overview of a situation, I feel like I can make better decisions within it. Yeah. And I didn't feel like you were giving me any answers. In fact, you were articulating a bunch of paradoxes, it seemed to me. But I appreciated the kind of honesty of that. <laughs> I don't know. I, I took a lot away from it. Mm-hmm. And then, though, I, you know, as a part of this show and with my blog writing over the years, I'm always like keeping tabs on what's going on in the yoga world. Like, what's the zeitgeist? And I'm trying to like see if I can be having the most relevant conversation. And through my feed, I see this article that Matthew Remsky wrote about you. And it had such a totally different read on you and what you were writing and basically painted you into like being kind of a monster. Mm-hmm. And I yeah, was, I, I read that. I was, I was like, wow, I didn't realize what a horrible person I was. Until <laughs> I read this article. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, I, I was sitting there and I was thinking, I'll just be honest. I was just questioning myself, you know, if I had a knee jerk reaction, which is what is he fucking talking about? You know? And then I, I said, well, wait a second, check yourself, you know, rather than just having the knee jerk social media reaction, maybe you should really question this. Mm -hmm. You know, have I been like deceived and manipulated by Charles Eisenstein? Like, or more importantly (laughs) for me, because, you know, I've been a yoga teacher for a lot of, a lot of time, like two decades now. And the practice I teach, it puts a very high value 
on this idea that each person has the ability to have an intuitive sense of knowing from within. And that when you operate from that place, that's where you know truth. And I started thinking, well, fuck, am I just like Charles Eisenstein? Am I what Remsky calls a white messianic wellness influencer? Mm-hmm. Am I like giving people these ideas that make them feel better and actually obscure more important social issues or whatever else that we should be focusing on? Am I part of the issue? And then I thought, what would Charles Eisenstein say about any of this? And I reflexively opened up a text window and started writing like an invitation letter for Charles Eisenstein to come on this show. And then when I, and you know, when I was writing it, I wasn't really thinking that I was going to send it. I was just trying to get to bed. Hmm. And then when I was done writing it, instead of just deleting it, I did a quick search and found your website and saw that there was a contact form and I just did a cut and paste send and I went to bed. Yeah. But I really didn't have any expectation that I would hear from you, much less find myself in this moment speaking to you. So this is a long-winded way of getting to say thank you for making yourself available like this and giving me some of your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, well, it's my pleasure. Um, and I'm happy to talk about any of the things that you brought up so far? Well, I guess my first curiosity is why? Why did you decide to do this? I imagine you get a lot of emails. I'm sure you could go on much more higher profile podcasts than this. You don't know me from nothing. What made you decide to do this with me? Oh, I don't know. Um, (laughs) I I could invoke intuition and just say like I had an intuitive feeling of, yeah, I want to do this one. Uh, but, you know, I have some of the same questions and doubts about intuition uh, as you do uh, and recognize how many people will will um, justify something uh, based on, you know, by invoking intuition, uh, which essentially puts it above any challenge. Oh, well, my intuition told me, you know, it's like saying God told me, so you can't challenge me on that because it's intuitive. And are you going to question my intuition? Uh, so I'm very wary of, of invoking intuition in that way, but um, I don't know. I, I have a history in yoga a little bit. You know, I took a YTT yoga teacher training back in 1999. I even practiced yoga when I was living in Taiwan in the nineties, there was a teacher there. And also <laughs> it's funny that the uh, critique that you mentioned painting me as like this feel good wellness, spiritual charlatan, uh, it's ironic. I think that person probably hasn't read a lot of my work because mostly I do write about social and political and ecological issues. You know, I'm not primarily a spiritual writer or teacher. I'm, I don't consider myself to be a spiritual teacher at all. In fact, I'm more of a, a, a philosopher. Um, well, it's interesting to hear you say that to jump in for a second, because I was not so familiar with your work up until maybe six weeks ago, but I do have a vague memory of hearing you speak or say something back when Occupy Wall Street was happening. I had a center in Brooklyn and I remember you from then. I didn't follow you after that, but I remember you from back then speaking about other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I visited Occupy and I, sp- and I spoke there and I, um, I wrote a book on economics called Sacred Economics, which is uh, a lot of you know nuts and bolts economics. So anyway, I, I like to um, be involved in I was going to say both worlds, you know, the more political activist world and the so-called spiritual world. But really part of the problem is the divide, uh, the conceptual divide between these worlds. And I, I, I believe it is necessary to expand politics to include that which had been in the category of spirituality because our politics um, for a long time has carried with it many of the same assumptions that undergird the very system that we're trying to change. We don't have a big enough data set. We don't have an expansive enough understanding of what is real and what is true and who we are. Operating from that limited data set, which I call like the story of separation, the separate self in a world of other, a mechanical universe in which consciousness resides only in human beings, you know, if we're locked into that 
paradigm, then the results that we will achieve will be limited by that paradigm. And there won't be very much change. So I think we need to bring in uh, information from the indigenous, from wisdom lineages, um, you know, including the yoga tradition, which even though it has been certainly distorted and co-opted, uh, it also has uh, threads of, of deep truth in it. Um, well, I guess that actually goes to another question I have. I mean, we'll put a pin in this um, yoga and activism and that overlap because I think we will go there. But I, I have a question about like your your viewpoint and where it comes from. I feel like in my own inquiry, I've noticed what I feel are like threads of, dare I say, kind of universal truths that run through all these different cultures and time, whether it's like, Gnostic Christianity or Tantric Buddhism, or there, there's these things that run through, or even Kabbalah, like you can see these threads that I think are what you refer to when you say the story of interbeing. Like I think mm-hmm. of that as a very ancient thread that I'm tapping into. And when I read your writing, I hear that viewpoint. And I'm wondering, how do you get to that? Do, are there particular traditions or schools or teachers that influenced you that you come to it through? I think that this knowledge is innate to every human being and it just needs to be awakened so that it can, so that we can inhabit that knowledge in a a social and economic context and intellectual context that denies it. So we have, we all carry this, this in many cases, lonely understanding that we are not alone, we are not separate, that that self and world are in an intimate existential relationship, you know, that it's not just uh, a bunch of random forces out there. Uh, and nor is it that the the kind of um, New Age translation of that, which says that, that um, our beliefs create our reality or something like that. But that, but that there is a mysterious connection between inner and outer, between self and other, between uh, mind and body, um, between you and me. Um, uh, and, and some kind of uh, intelligence in the world. Like this knowledge, every child naturally sees the world that way. It's full of beings. The sun is shining on me. The sun is a being. It, every child, it, it makes sense to ask a child, is the sun happy right now? And scientific ideology has said that that is an anthropomorphic projection, a childish projection onto the sun of human qualities. And we grow up and realize that that is nonsense. We grow out of that. So there's also an element of cultural imperialism here, uh, or, or you could even call it metaphysical imperialism, that says that because indigenous people also believe that the sun is a being, and so is the wind, and so is the river, and so is the mountain, and so is the wolf, and every being out there is a being, the ocean, the, 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 the clouds, the moon, therefore they are childish and primitive too, and that the development of their culture will be to grow out of that. So to answer your question, I I didn't come to this through any deep study of any of these venerable traditions. Um, I've, you know, I've done a little bit of reading in Buddhism, Sufism, Taoism. I lived in Taiwan for nine years and absorbed through direct experience uh, of some of a very different way of seeing the world. Uh, That was in the, 80s and 90s, you know, when when there was still a lot of the uh, old society present there. Uh, but uh, I guess but, the, the question yeah. comes, let me say something else, because the question comes from this idea of like, I agree, first of all, that like the knowledge is innate to each person. I, I would completely agree with that. I guess in the yoga world these days, because there's been all these, you know, kind of falling from grace in the guru traditions where for a long time, you just cited a lineage or tradition, and that was what gave you credibility. Now, with all the abuses, 
there's like a real call for transparency in sources. And like you said earlier, like when we say it's, oh, I just came to this through my direct experience, it's like you're just, that's what makes it messianic, right? Because we can't cite the sources from which it's coming. Well, it would be messianic if if I had access to this through my direct experience and you didn't, and uh. and you know nobody else did. But what I'm saying is that it is innate in everybody. How it is awakened in each person is different. It could be through reading these texts. It could be through a psychedelic experience. It could be through an experience in nature. Um, it could be through a near death experience. It could be through one of these um, miraculous healings that people dis- discover. I mean, there are so many ways that, that uh, so many, so many ways of confirming what we secretly suspect everybody in a modern society, which is that there's something that they're not telling us here. So, yes, yeah. but you see, that's interesting when you say that, like that just sounded like a conspiracy theory, right? Like there's something that they're not telling us. Now, when we say they are not telling us, who are we referring to? Who's yeah, they? They is, uh, it's a, they is an archetypal being. Um, obviously there's like, so, so I, I also wrote an essay on conspiracy theory, basically saying that, that this sense that, there that we are trapped in a much smaller reality than the true reality that the system is not operating for our well-being uh that there's something that that we're not being told like this i i think that this is an authentic recognition that then gets translated onto a narrative of well there must be a group of evil conspirators doing this to us otherwise it wouldn't be happening so, but I think that that is actually a diversion of the recognition onto a false target. I see. I I, I get that because, like I said at the beginning, it feels to me like you're really trying to take it to a much more macro question. But I guess the like the criticism, just, let me just interrupt. It's, it's, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Like it's to say it's so. So you say okay, it's the you know Illuminati. You know, it's Bill Bill Gates and the Clintons and George Soros, et cetera, et cetera. It's this group of evil people, then you don't look at the systems. You don't look at capitalism. You don't look at white supremacy. You don't look at patriarchy. You don't look at the mythology that underlies all three of those systems, which is the mythology of the separate self and the program of control, the idea that 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 the, the narration of human history as an ascent from a state of superstitious ignorance and helplessness, uh, uh, barely surviving against hostile nature to this paradise of technological control uh, where we become the lords and masters of the universe. Like that is an entire mythology uh, in which we play the role of a discrete separate individual, the neoliberal subject of economic discourse or the Darwinian self-interest maximizing unit like the, the, this is all part of a big mythology that underlies capitalism, patriarchy, white supremacy, and so forth. So, so to 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 blame a group of bad guys uh, dis- diverts our attention from looking at the systems that generate bad guys to begin with. I'm not saying that there's not people doing horrible things, but what is the context that creates those people? We don't look at that when we fixate on the bad guys. And when we do that, we enter into a war. And war is one of the defining features of civilization. So that's why I really, if I had to label myself, I say I would say I'm a peace worker. Okay, I hear that. And it's just it's so interesting because what you just said about, <laughs> about that, that uh, thread of people um, thinking that there's a cabal of evil overlords doing it, taking us away from the issues of addressing patriarchy and social injustice. Um, The criticism of you is that you are actually a Trojan horse for that thinking that like, like you, because, and this is, I've been, I've been immersing myself in your critics as well, honestly, because I was like, okay, let me understand what that they're saying, you know? And the argument that I hear, if I understand it, is that, um, because you are giving kind of equal weight to lots of different narratives, 
Like you're saying, oh, some people think like what you were just saying, that it's 5G and Bill Gates is trying to inject us with nanobots. And then other people are, you know, citing data from the CDC or, or that sometimes that statistical data is being interpreted in ways that aren't showing to be true as time goes on even, you know, so that you're, you're, present, you're giving equal weight to different narratives I guess yeah. the suggestion is is that some narratives are more true than others or or are more likely to be true than others, you know, like is it more or less likely to be true that Bill Gates is trying to inject us with nanobots? And if mm-hmm. we give it equal weight, are we not then basically, you know, lulling people into a sense of feeling better and thereby, you know, not focusing on the things that you're saying that we in doing that and giving equal weight, you are also uh, distracting people from addressing patriarchy and social injustice that you and QAnon, you see like there's an yeah. overlap between QAnon and Gwyneth Paltrow or something. And you're in there or something. Uh-huh. Right. Um, I've got, yeah, a couple things to say about that. Um, first, if you absolutely know for sure that, uh, the CDC and the WHO and the um, uh, scientific establishment and the um, other establishments that surround it are, are uh, hold. If you actually know for sure that they're, that the reality that they narrate to us is, is reality is the truth. Then if you advance any alternative theory, any dissenting view, you must be, uh, deluded, less intelligent, or have some nefarious agenda because you're just not seeing the obvious truth like I see it. But I would just point out that the establishment truth has been shown again and again and again to be not the truth, um, which doesn't mean that they are deliberately lying to us, although sometimes they are. I mean, look at the deliberate lies perpetrated by J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI uh, 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 about Martin Luther King and the very, very real conspiracy to um, disrupt the civil rights, to destroy the civil rights movement through like all of these uh, saboteurs and, and inside agents and poison pen letters and all that kind of stuff. They infiltrated that movement. They infiltrated uh, the, the, the Occupy Wall Street. They infiltrated the environmental movement in the '90s. They infiltrated um, Standing Rock. This is standard practice. So I don't. Th- and and you can, you know, I, I used to. It's it's funny that that somehow I get associated with the right wing for criticizing an orthodoxy that is um, promoted by corporate interests. I thought that was supposed to be left wing when you question an orthodoxy perpetrated by uh, corporate interests like the pharmaceutical industry, um, like the telecommunications industry. Like, I'm not saying, oh, it's caused by 5G or something like that, but I'm like, look at the research that um, seems to me to demonstrate that. It doesn't necessarily demonstrate that 5G causes COVID-19. I don't actually believe that. But it certainly does uh, damage biological systems. Um, it, there, there's, there's a lot of research that would at least lead you to question that. Um, same thing with vaccines. Uh, same thing with glyphosate. Um, you, you can't just write this off as conspiracy theory. That becomes a, a, a slur that quashes any kind of dissent. And I think that is really dangerous, whether or not these theories are, are true. Now, I think, so for example, Bill Gates, um, I could, like, I, I haven't heard him say he wants to, I mean, this, you know, to inject people with, with microchips, but I could see how that idea would be appealing to somebody in his position and to somebody who is deeply immersed in the ideology of technological utopia that, that again, narrates history as this ascent toward a um, intelligently, rationally administered 
society where we maximize human well-being through converting the world into a data set and then deploying uh, AI algorithms to maximize the, the, the good of humanity as determined by various metrics. Uh, like there's, you don't have to be evil to believe in this vision of humanity, uh, of, of the future. Or even that uh, it would if, benefit humanity to do it. Yeah, of course. I mean, if you're in, in, in power right now um, and, and you're like, okay, here's how we're going to keep people safe. We're going to make sure that they don't infect each other. We're going to um, trace all of their contacts. We're gonna, we, have to make, we have to keep tabs on everybody and know where they are at all times for their own good. We're not going to abuse this. This is, don't you get it? This is for the good of humanity. Like if somebody is immersed in that story, they're going to do the things that look to the conspiracy theorist as an evil plot to uh, assume totalitarian control over society. So the problem is not the people in these positions. The problem is in the story that writes their roles for them, that, that authors their roles in this um, project of perfect control. And I would say also that this mentality of control manifests as all of the abuses of imperialism and colonialism and um, uh, uh, oppression, racism. You, you are, are exploiting and extracting and dominating. It is the mentality of domination. That's what it is. And the mentality of domination plays out in every aspect of our civilization. So that's, that's my inner leftist. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've identified as a leftist my entire life, ever since I read the people's history of the United States uh, when I was a teenager. You know, it's, it's just so ironic <laughs> to me that questioning the orthodoxy, again, has become something associated with the right wing. Well, I guess, you know, there's, it's interesting because you brought up, um, you know, vaccinations. And just last week, I had a, a guy named Timothy McCall on who was a doctor for 10 years and then decided to stop practicing medicine and become a yoga therapist. And we talked about vaccines too. And I guess, like, even just now, when I asked you that question, you started by saying you don't necessarily think that Bill Gates is injecting anybody or wants to, but then you opened up the possibility that he might, and you talked about why that might be, and it might not be an evil cabal that he's doing it. But and it I would think naturally that, occur if it not to him to somebody else. Why wouldn't you do it? Yeah, and, and and I think it's what I'm getting at is I think that there's a difference. Like there's reasonable questions to be asked, but sometimes that gets obscured by actual kind of. Uh, like you were pointing to conspiracy theories and anti-vaccination is this perfect example because, you know, I personally, you know, had children who were vaccinated and I lived in New York and frankly, we didn't really have much choice. I didn't feel like, like to choose not to get vaccinations in New York city, if your kids are going to public school is a real bitch and maybe yeah. not even possible now. Um, but back then, you know, we decided we were going to do it, but we also, you know, we wanted to assert some control where we had a pediatrician who would let us alter the schedule so we didn't mm -hmm. do all of them at the same time. And I deeply immersed myself in like anti-vaccination literature. And, you know, there are a bunch of people out there who I think had kids who got vaccinated and then came down with, um, you know, different conditions or side effects and they're pissed. And I can understand, you know, like if that happened to my kid, I think I'd be an anti-vaxxer too if I was convinced that it was the vaccinations that did it. And those folks are saying, you know, vaccinations cause, uh, you know, uh, all, uh, what's it, Alz not Alzheimer's, uh, autism. Autism, Va yeah. Yeah, vaccinations cause autism. And then there's not science to prove that. And they're asserting that as a fact. And, you know, I've got two kids who've gotten vaccinations and they don't have autism. So there you go. There's some anecdotal evidence right there that you're wrong. And right. that muddies the water for any reasonable questions about it. Like, I right. wonder whether there needs to be aluminum in them so they have to have a longer shelf life or whether we need to do so many at once. Like, I think those are reasonable questions, but you can't ask those reasonable questions because if you ask even a reasonable question, you're now like you're being accused of a Trojan horse for the anti-vax movement. Right. And this is, this is a symptom of what, I'm, what, what people call narrative warfare, where the most important thing becomes to win the argument, to dominate the other side. So if a piece of information comes in 
that, well, okay, maybe it's true, but you know, if we say that, if we admit that into the canon of fact, then it's going to offer ammunition for the other side. Well, we better not do that. We better not admit that into the canon of fact. And even, and if somebody brings it up, that must, because it's going to serve the other side, they must be on the other side if they're even bringing this up. So this is inevitable when we conceive of a better world as coming about through defeating an enemy. That is a deep programming of, of civilization, I would say, uh, going all the way back to the beginnings of agriculture and, and conquest, where, where you know, the, you, you, the ancient kings, they were the king because they conquered the wild beasts and conquered the barbarians and drained the wetlands. I mean, this was happening in the Middle East thousands of years ago, draining wetlands, cutting down forests. Evil in those days was associated with the wild, good with the domestic. So this way of thinking extends to, to uh, like the war on terror. You know, terrorism is caused by terrorists. And if we can kill the terrorists, then we win. Crime is caused by criminals. Um, crop damage is caused by insects. If we kill the insects uh, and create a perfectly controlled environment where no being is out of place, every weed, every insect, they've been banished, then we will have uh, a paradise of high yield agriculture. Like this whole way of thinking, it applies to medicine too. You find the bad guy and destroy the bad guy. It's pretty unyogic, if you ask me, the, this uh, pattern of othering uh, and domination um, and how it is inevitable when we conceive of improvement as a matter of winning a victory over an, oppo- an opponent. To do that, you have to find an opponent first. You have to, you have to erect an enemy and so that you can wage war <clears throat> on that enemy and win. As long as, and I see both sides, every side immersed in this mentality, which means that we are going to have endless war until, well, okay. And and I think a lot of people are now actually um, transcending that mentality. Uh, For example, when they see an enemy, when they cast a judgment on somebody looking at the mirror, uh, doing Byron Katie work, for example, like looking at the mirror, okay. What I am condemning, how is it alive inside of myself? And how do I participate in the systems that I am condemning as other? So there is, this is where I have hope. It's, it's, you could say that it is a upliftment of consciousness. But what does that actually mean? What does it mean to raise our consciousness? Like, does anyone ever say what that actually is? Well, I think what it is, is you become conscious of things you were not conscious of before. So it's, it's not that some people have higher consciousness than others. It's that, in fact, all of us have blind spots and gaps in our consciousness and whole territories of attention that we do not go to. So the raising of consciousness actually means simply to bring in the excluded and marginalized data points, including those that have been excluded because that's what the other side is saying. Like, are you so sure that everything your side is saying is right? Maybe you should, you know, spend some time in, in reading the best of the other side rather than your own pundit's uh, version of what the other side is saying. Most people only read the other side through the filter of their side. Like, maybe we, we have to start questioning our identity as being good and right in order to allow our. To, to allow new information to come in so that our consciousness can actually be raised. I think that's really interesting, this idea of like raising consciousness, because right now, again, with the pandemic, there's such a high, I don't know, it seems like premium being put on science. And just last week, I was having this conversation again also about, you know, how when you, for instance, try to do research on yoga, Timothy McCall was saying that as soon as you uh, you start to study it through this like double blind placebo scientific lens, you've already put it in a frame where like the holistic whole thing you're trying to look at is no longer it. He says you're studying like a third rate version of yoga therapy. It's not what people actually do. Right. And so, you know, I was looking at some of the um, like comments and responses to your the coronation that you wrote and 
And I was looking for like, again, criticisms and it, I found this one, which I really felt like it articulates a viewpoint that I think you're pointing to that is really at the heart of a lot of these um, assertions. And it, and it said, I'm going to quote it, it says, science is a method that allows us to work around intrinsic human defects and discover how the world works with increasing degrees of confidence. And I just thought that, well, that's right there, that that there's a certain viewpoint of science, and I don't think all scientists or even people working within medicine think this way, that that starts from a place of lacking, like intrinsic human defects. And mm-hmm. that, to me, shapes this idea of trying to like control that there's almost like the the parts of nature that are like unexplainable or like you know that we we don't understand need to be kind of like suppressed yeah. so that we can feel more confident well i mean i think what that person's saying and i would agree with it is that that science um the 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 sacred essence of science is humility it says well, I might have my opinions and beliefs about the world, but let's do an experiment and find out for sure. Let us ask something beyond ourselves that we're calling reality, whether this is true or not. That is the essence of the scientific method. You formulate a hypothesis, you test the hypothesis. And if that test is repeatable and verifiable by others, then you accept it as truth. Now, I will say that that approach to truth, to finding truth itself bears certain metaphysical assumptions, such as that the question you ask reality doesn't affect the reality that you are asking. Um, That the intent with which an experiment is performed doesn't alter the effect of the experiment. That variables can fundamentally be isolated. Uh, One of the variables being who's performing the experiment. Uh, Science is based on the isolation of variables, which, which, uh, can be done if you think that you know what affects what, like what is causally related to what. So it, it, uh, so theoretically it shouldn't matter who is doing the experiment because the experiment, you know, you're, you're doing the exact same procedure. It doesn't matter who's performing that procedure, right? It should produce the same outcome. To, right. But that, there, and, and that may be true, but there is an assumption, an unprovable metaphysical assumption there. That you can, and that that the whatever. The- if you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com/slash premium.